So just to quickly introduce myself, my name's Emma Coro. I'm coordinator of My Community Applied Mycology, which is a citizen science group that studies fungi. As part of that, I coordinate something called the Wild Fungi DNA Project, which I'll be talking a lot about later. And I was winner of the 2021 AXA Seed Grant. So I'm just going to start off by introducing My Community Applied Mycology, which is our citizen science group that I'm involved with. So we're a smallish not-for-profit organisation that involves both professional and citizen scientists. We try to get them to work together. Uh, one of the things we do a lot of is education and awareness building. So we've done um, courses and also one-off workshops on a whole lot of different topics like the ones listed here. So this photo is of one of our microscopy workshops that we did in Thornbury a couple of years ago. Uh, but we don't just do education, we also do research. So we've been doing a lot of ecological surveying. Um, we also do DNA sequencing of fungi and we've been working with environmental DNA. We also have a lab that citizen scientists can use and that includes a lot of uh, mushroom culturing and growing equipment. Uh, microscopes and also things like thermocyclers for working with DNA. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the mycology community in general because it might give people a bit of an understanding of why we organise the way we do and why our project is important. Um, so mycology has been very understudied. Uh, only about 20% of mushroom forming fungi have even been described and probably only about 5% of fungi generally. Uh, the area has been quite underfunded over recent years, but that is changing a little bit, which is good. And there's very few people employed in as mycologists. Most people work at, you know, at unis. Um, the amount of people employed as actual mycologists, you could probably count on one hand, at least the one studying macro fungi. So it's quite a small community and everybody kind of knows each other. It's also an area that's super reliant on citizen scientists, both overseas, but even more so in Australia. So most of the data about uh, where fungi occur it has been collected by citizen scientists. And this has been collected over the last uh, maybe two or three decades through citizen science projects such as FungiMap, which has been collecting sightings of fungi and recording them in a database since the early 90s. And they've moved to using iNaturalist now. So there's a fungi map project on iNaturalist and that data then gets aggregated in the Atlas of Living Australia and, and other places. I think the other thing to note is that fungi, while understudied in universities and places like that, are becoming extremely popular with the Public. So since that movie Fantastic Fungi came out a couple of years ago, we've just had a huge influx of uh, amateur mycologists who are just really excited about how mushrooms can change the world and that sort of thing. And a lot of the cultivation methods that we used were actually developed by citizen mycologists, um, you know, over about the last 20 years. And there's a lot of, you know, huge sort of Facebook groups and citizen scientist groups around the world where people discuss uh, fungi, mushroom hunting, and even things like DNA sequencing. So a lot of these citizen scientists go well beyond just taking photos and uploading them to iNaturalist. A lot of them get right into taxonomy. They do things like microscopy, even describing species. And one of the things that people have gotten really interested in over the last 10 years or so is DNA sequencing. I think part of what influenced this is that, you know, citizen science labs started to be opened overseas. And we've had a couple of these in Australia as well, which gives people access to the equipment they need, like um, thermocyclers to prepare samples for sequencing. So some of the work people have done is really impressive. They've spent, you know, quite a lot of their own money at times on getting sequencing done. And they've even gone and taught themselves bioinformatics and that kind of thing. So one example here is this picture of an Australian oyster mushroom. So uh, this was debated whether it was really an oyster mushroom and therefore whether it was edible. So Jonathan McGibbon, a citizen scientist, sent it off for sequencing back in 2015, I think. Um, and he got back results and found out that yes, indeed, it was a local edible mushroom. 
There have, however, been some problems with how this is done. Uh, one is that people weren't using scientific collection permits, probably because they didn't really know they needed them. And also they're often being sent to individuals or labs overseas, which is a bit problematic in terms of the Nagoya protocol, especially when we're looking at edible or possibly medicinal mushrooms. And our organisation also got set up through this process. So in 2018, I organised in conjunction with the community lab Bioquisitive to have a workshop on how to do DNA barcoding. And everyone who attended that workshop decided that they really wanted to set up a group. So it was about a year after that that I found out that you could get a portable DNA sequencer called the MinIron. I went along to one of their uh, Oxford Nanopore conferences, found out about all the different stuff it can do, including environmental DNA, got really excited and started writing up a grant proposal. So we ended up getting our grant from the Wet and Whole Environment Trust. We got a small environment grant for the Wild Fungi DNA project. Now this project, it has three main aims. One is to support citizen scientists who want to work with DNA. So you know, provide training and help people get on proper permits and stuff like that. Uh, we also really want to increase baseline data about Australian fungi. So we've been training people in collecting herbarium specimens and we're getting those specimens sequenced. Originally we were going to use the Minone, but we actually recently got uh, funding from BioPlatform. So all of those specimens that we collected are now going to get whole genome sequencing done on them, which is just really fantastic. Um, and we also want to use it for environmental DNA, including, you know, uh, learning about these techniques and developing them more so that they're a bit easier for citizen scientists to use. So in 2021, we got the Australian Citizen Science Association seed grant. Uh, we ended up using this buying a bunch of equipment that we needed, like scientific pipettes and a couple of dry bath heat blocks. Just having, um, you know, enough of these that we could bring in a bunch of volunteers at once instead of one at a time was really helpful. So we ran a, a sort of uh, course and series of events where we trained volunteers in things like taking herbarium specimens, how to take cultures of specimens, and also how to extract DNA for sequencing. So I think overall we ended up training up around 30 people that year. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the challenge that we've faced and also some of the lessons that we've learnt along the way. So I think the big one, which everyone will know, is fundraising. Um, and this is definitely not unique to us or unique to citizen science. I think the scientists in general are just having to spend more and more of our time trying to get money. Um, but yeah, for us, a lot of the fundraising that we've done has been through educational events. So basically we charge people a small fee to come to a mushroom growing workshop or something like that. We try to keep our scientific training events free because obviously we're wanting people to do something for us there, which is, you know, to help us collect data. But with things like mushroom growing or foraging, we generally charge for that. And that's where a lot of our uh, money comes from. We've also organised a big mushroom festival in Melbourne last year, and we're doing that again this year. Um, and while these events are really enjoyable, they're also extremely time and energy consuming. So what that means is it's been very hard to balance spending time on fundraising to buy the equipment we need to do science versus spending time on the actual science that we want to do. So that's been, yeah, pretty challenging. So I think the Access Seed grants are really great and particularly for kicking off projects, which is usually the hardest time to scrape together money. Um, they've been really good for all kinds of groups. But one thing I've noticed is that funding for citizen science tends to come at either the very small side of the spectrum. So, you know, a thousand dollars to organize some kind of event for science week, or it tends to come at the really large end of the spectrum, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when I've looked at these, you know, bigger federal grants, basically all the organisations that are getting them are like huge universities, museums, things like that, and groups like ours really can't compete. 
So what I'd really like to see more of is a bit like uh, some of the grants I saw in Queensland over the last few years, which is more of these sort of mid-sized ten to thirty thousand dollar grants that smaller organisations and more grassroots organisations can apply for. And I think um, those grants get a lot of value for money too, because small organisations often, you know, they use money pretty efficiently and can achieve a lot with very little. So another challenge that we've found is it takes quite a lot of work to train volunteers up to the level needed to do things like DNA extractions. Uh, so this takes a lot of work from us and it also takes quite a high level of commitment of time from the volunteers. And I think volunteer retention is always a little bit difficult because people are working for free and they have to balance it with other, you know, more important life commitments. Um, but we found it's become particularly challenging over the last few years, which is, you know, partly to do with the pandemic and there's a lot of um, economic insecurity and people are also very, very time poor at the moment. I think a lot of citizen science projects, you know, re rely quite heavily on retirees because they have time and they have money. Um, but the people we tend to attract a lot of the time are actually younger people. So a lot of students who want to get lab experience and stuff like that, which means that they often, um, you know, can't stick around for a very long time because they have uni commitments and, you know, life changes going on. So another change I've really seen over the last few years is that we get a lot more volunteers who are looking for business opportunities. So people who are learning to grow mushrooms because they want to set up a small business or they want to set up a business doing foraging tours. And we even get people who want to set up businesses doing scientific work. And sometimes those people really don't have the background that would be required to do such a thing. And we still get a lot of the sort of more old school volunteers who either want to get work experience or who just want to do something good for the environment and for science. But I have found that, you know, there can be a bit of tension there because one, everyone's very time poor, they're cash poor, um, and people come in looking for opportunities to make money and they really are non-existent because there's not much money in mycology. Hopefully that's changing a bit, but at the moment there isn't. Our organisation doesn't have much money. We aren't even able to pay any admin people or anything like that. Um, so there is a bit of an expectation there sometimes which just doesn't hold up to reality. So we really don't have any solutions to these problems at the moment. Um, we try to provide opportunities for people to volunteer in different ways and at different levels, however they feel comfortable. Um, but we still haven't really been able to find a good balance of how to do this. So one of the major problems we've been encountering is that as sinners and scientists basically try to work things out ourselves without um, a huge amount of support from institutions or professionals, we often find that we've made silly mistakes that we may not have made if we were in a university setting or something like that. For example, setting up uh, an experiment with inadequate replication or finding it difficult to understand how to you know, follow instructions, say, on a DNA extraction kit. Um, you know, none of these have been huge, but they have at times been slightly frustrating and they've often been things which I think if, you know, we were working in a professional lab, someone would just tell us, no, you, you've got to do it this way. Fortunately, we have been very, very lucky that there's a lot of professional mycologists who are really enthusiastic about science and science and see it as important. So they've been quite willing to help us, um, help us in designing experiments, accessing resources, all that kind of stuff. So that's been really great. But to get that kind of support as a citizen scientist, you really have to know a lot of people in order to find people who are willing to help. And that's a lot easier in a small community like in mycology. But I feel like for a lot of people, it might actually be quite difficult to make those kind of connections. So I think that networking events such as this conference are really important. And I wish I could be there in person, but I can't. So one thing I think would be useful is to think more about what kind of ways that professional and citizen scientists can work together and how they can meet each other and, you know, not just have citizen scientists as data collectors, but, you know, involve them in all parts of the scientific process. This is something I know has started happening more and more, and I think that's a really great trend. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the conference.